OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Miller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google in Switzerland. Um, Part of my role is to talk to webmasters like you guys and make sure that you're getting all the information you need from us to help make the web a great place. So we have a bunch of questions that were already submitted. And uh, before we get started, as always, if one of you guys wants to ask the first question, feel free to go ahead. There, I'll go, John. OK. Okay, um, about three months ago, I freaked out because I discovered I had 90 subdomains indexed for my website that didn't actually exist. And what I worked out, it had what had gone wrong is go ahead. Okay, what I've worked has gone wrong is in my DNS records, there'd been a wildcard entry. They're going to mute them. Okay, so I ended up with these 90 subdomains. I, so I had to create um, webmaster accounts for them, and then I just cancelled, did a complete uh, like website removal. But what I want to know is, is that is that okay to do that? That I and then I then I cut out that wildcard entry altogether. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good thing to do there. So from our point of view, the wildcard DNS is particularly problematic for crawling, because we end up crawling all of these duplicates. And we think, oh, there must be something good here. We'll keep looking. And we keep running across new subdomains and trying to pick them up. So. Uh, if you remove the wildcard DNS entry, that's essentially the most important part. Uh, using the removal tools for the stuff that's already indexed is fine as well. Yeah, because I ended up with like, oh, like 6,000 different duplicate pages. It was just out of control. Yeah. So okay. from a practical point of view, these, this kind of duplicate content shouldn't be causing problems for your website. It's not that we penalize your website for that. It's just uh, technically a problem that we have to kind of crawl all of these pages and then figure out that they're actually duplicates, and we'll filter them out in the search results. Uh, but it's a lot of work that has to be done on your server, on our side, to actually get that far. So it's not that you'd be penalized for that. You wouldn't be demoted or anything like that. It's really just a, a technical problem. OK, cool. Thank you. Sure. Morning, John. How are you doing? Good morning. Good. So uh, about in May, we had a site that had a manual link penalty applied. And uh, we actually saw the penalty appear across the main www, as well as a couple of other subdomains. And uh, after about four months, the penalty happened to expire. And so that manual action disappeared from within Webmaster Tools. Um, and so what I'm curious about is because those manual actions disappeared from all of the subdomains, um, was that a single penalty that happened to be applied across the entire site, or were those subdomains subject to individual penalties that all happen to be applied and expire at the same time? Um, so both could be possible in the sense that uh, if we can, we try to be as granular as possible. So we try to target a specific subdomain if that's just one subdomain that's uh, problematic. If we can't do that, then sometimes we're kind of broader and just apply it to the whole domain. So theoretically, both of those would be possible. Usually, you'd t tell if this is just affecting one subdomain. You'd see that just there in Webmaster Tools, and you wouldn't see it for the other subdomains. So, uh, for instance, if you have something like Blogger, for example, where you have lots of completely different websites on different subdomains, then that's something where we probably try to do something more granular and just say, this is for this specific subdomain. Whereas if these are essentially just different parts of your website and they happen to be on different subdomains, then it's possible that the WebSAM team will say, well, it doesn't make sense to target each of these subdomains individually, so we'll just apply it to the whole domain. 
Thank you. All right. Um, let's go through some of the questions that we have here. Uh, is it possible to accidentally lock out the Google crawler other than using the robot's text? Um, I guess there are a lot of ways you could theoretically block Googlebot. Uh, there are things that you could do, for example, uh, by, by blocking the IP address, uh, by having some kind of a firewall in between that recognizes Googlebot as some kind of malicious script that's trying to scrape your website, for example, and then some firewall in your network essentially blocks it. That's something we see from time to time. Uh, sometimes we see it that uh, a website responds to different user agents in different ways and, for whatever reason, recognizes Googlebot as some kind of a script and says, oh, I don't want to serve you any content. We sometimes see that. Uh, with the robot's text file, one thing we do sometimes see there is sites that serve a server error for the robot's text file. So instead of serving content, they serve a server error, like the 500 error, which essentially tells us that uh, the server has some content that it would like to show, but it can't at the moment. And on our side, we treat that as the robot's text essentially blocking us from crawling completely. So if you serve a server error for the robot's text file, then we'll assume that we can't crawl anything because we don't know what we're allowed to be crawling, and we'll stop crawling completely. Um, these are all things that we show in Webmaster Tools in the crawl errors section, though. Even if you're blocking the IP address or blocking the user agent, then you'd see things like uh, uh, un server unreachable, those kind of errors in the crawl errors section in Webmaster Tools. Um, I noticed there are a whole bunch of app indexing questions here. I can't really help with those because I don't have that much experience uh, actually debugging those. But we do have a separate Google Moderator page set up for app, in app indexing questions specifically. Um, so I copy those in there. I copied down all the questions, so I'll double check that they're already in the Moderator page. But I can't really help with uh, that here at the Hangout at the moment. It's good to see that people are using app indexing, though. So. I hope we can uh, resolve those questions there. Let me just clean these out here for the moment, um, make it a little bit easier to find other questions. Um, wouldn't it be better if instead of penalizing algorithms, you invested resources in developing and launching rewarding algorithms that dramatically increase the rankings for good websites? Um, Essentially, we do this with uh, things like Panda, where we try to recognize higher quality content and show it appropriately in search. And uh, even with all of our other algorithms, if at uh, some point we're recognizing lower quality content and showing it lower in search, then of course the higher quality content that's left kind of bubbles up a little bit higher. So it's always the case that there are two sides to these algorithms. It's never the case that we uh, penalize all of these websites, or we demote them in search, and nothing else bubbles up because we have to show something to users when they search. So it's always the case that there, there are both sides involved with these algorithms. And that's something that we also include in our analysis when we analyze how these algorithms are doing, um, how we need to tweak them. It's not just that we look at the sites that we're removing from search, but also the sites that are showing up higher in search and making sure that those are actually the, the right kind of sites, the sites that we'd like to show. Hi, John. Yes. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, Panda does uh, some promotion of sites as well as uh, filtering or what we might call uh, demoting of content? Well, it's always both sides that are involved there. If you're demoting some, then the other stuff comes up higher. So it's, it's something where it, it's more of a philosophical question, I guess, if you want to look at it as something that's bubbling up higher quality content or pushing down lower quality content. Because in the end, the lower quality content goes a little bit further to the back, and the higher quality content goes a little bit further to the front. So uh, right. So, but does it highlight any of the uh, quality points, or is it always focusing on uh, 
the problem negative parts of a device. It, it always involves both both parts. So that's something where in our algorithms we try to recognize the higher quality content and treat it appropriately. So it's never the case that the algorithm will just go out and look for bad signs and signs that you're doing something wrong. It would also need to make sure that it's treating the sites that are doing something right appropriately as well. OK, so it's not fair to call these uh, a penalty algorithm or a panda, for example, when exactly. it also looks at uh, good content or uh, good pages as well. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't call these penalties internally because essentially they're just a way of us trying to show the more relevant, higher quality content in search. And it's not the case that we're only looking at the bad sites and saying, oh, these guys are doing something wrong. We need to get them out of our search results. It's really the, the matter of us trying to provide really high quality search results overall. And that means bringing up these higher quality pages that might not otherwise have ranked there. OK. Uh, does that apply more to newer editions of Panda, for example? Are they better at looking at good quality uh, uh, content or items than, say, the, the older versions? Um, I, I'd like to say that, uh, of course, every time we do an update, we try to make them better. So. Uh, that's something where we try to bring this in all the time with our updates. So uh, I don't know specifically with the, the newest update we have there, but that's something where we're definitely trying to make sure that we're treating these sites appropriately. And uh, when we make bigger updates that we actually call out, we do hope that it takes a significant step further in that direction. Right. Yeah, because I remembered Matt talking about uh, we were looking for, um, uh, this was back uh, a year or so, they were looking, we're looking for some signals of some of the medium or borderline sites, uh, you know, which might mean these sites are good sites and, you know, they didn't need to get lumped in so it could filter some of those borderline uh, sites better and maybe from the uh, positive aspects as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Those, that's the kind of feedback that we use to kind of refine our algorithms. So from time to time, we'll try to call out uh, requests for feedback on these kind of things. I know we also have a form open for Penguin since, since the beginning uh, that we kind of go through every now and then to double check what's happening there. And it's always good to give us feedback in, in that regard. And even if we don't have anything specific open any kind of feedback channel for something. If you see something working particularly well or particularly bad, take the time to bring it to us so that we can talk to the engineers about it and see what we need to improve there. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, are you advised to continually update the disavow file if and when new URLs are found? Yes, if you notice problems, I definitely add them to the disavow file so that they can be taken into account the next time uh, we crawl and index those URLs. So this isn't something where I'd say you fill it out once and you leave it running forever. Um, if you notice a problem, you can help us to fix that by adding it to the disavow file. Yeah, hi, John. Hi. Yeah, small question for you. OK. Yeah, the question is that when we are searching uh, some word titles in Google uh, with uh, some keywords, related keywords, uh, it was displaying another titles which is from uh, another, rather which is not specified in the titles, meta titles like. Yeah, okay, why this is happening, uh, we, we don't know. Um, so with the titles, we try to rewrite them when we can recognize that the original title on the page wasn't that, that great. Uh, for example, if there are a lot of related keywords in the title, that's something that maybe the user wasn't that interested in, kind of this keyword stuffing issue. Uh, when we recognize that the same title is used across large parts of the website, that's something that we try to improve on. Uh, when we recognize that the title is particularly long, we'll try to find something that fits in the shorter visible space in the search results. That's particularly useful for 
uh, mobile, for example. On smartphone, you have even less space. So we have to have an even shorter title that we can show users there. And sometimes we'll also take into account something from the, the DMOZ, the Open Directory project. Uh, if there's a site title there, then we might look at that as well and use that. You can block the, the ODP title by using the no ODP meta tag. Uh, but the other titles that are rewritten, that's something that our algorithms do automatically. That's not something you can specifically block. You can help to avoid that by really making sure that all of the titles across your site are short and to the point, uh, that they're really about the content on your page, that we can really show them one-to-one -one in search and make sure that users understand what your page is about. Uh, one thing to keep in mind there as well is that uh, titles can change depending on the query. Uh, so from our point of view, we don't just have one title for a page. We might have a, a small collection of titles that we swap in and out depending on what the user is searching for so that the user can recognize that this is really a great page for this specific topic that they're searching for. Yeah, thank you. Does that help? Yeah, nothing else is going on. So, hi, John, just a quick question. OK. Um, you launched uh, Structured Snippets uh, recently, and you've seen them showing up in a lot of the, the rankings. Obviously, they help quite a lot with um, regards to kind of adding extra information to your actual SERP snippet. Um, I just wondered, uh, I know that there's um, schema markup for a lot of sites, but looking at a lot of the sites that have the structured snippets, they don't seem to have any schema on there. So I just kind of wondered how you went about getting that information off the page and if there's anything that we can do to kind of entice you to do that off, um, off our site sort of thing. Uh, we have magic algorithms. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is something that's sometimes quite hard to do algorithmically. So the, the clearer the information is structured on the site, the easier we can pick that up. Uh, sometimes it helps to have like tabular information or to use uh, clear list definitions, something like that to help pick it up. If you want to use schema.org markup to give us more information about the specific entities that you're talking about, that's, that's something you could do as well. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that these are still very experimental features and it's something that we might notice doesn't make so much sense to show this much information in search, or the webmasters aren't happy with uh, showing this much information in search, or users are confused by seeing um, information that was extracted incorrectly. And uh, so I could imagine that this is something that might be, might be changing in the future. So uh, I try to, as, as a webmaster, I guess, if you want to kind of leverage this thing, I try to make sure that your information is as structured as possible on the pages, and that where you can, you use schema.org markup to let us know about entities and attributes and those kind of things. But I can't guarantee that we'll be showing them specifically for your site or for any site. OK, no, that's that, that's fine. I, I know with um, Schema as well, before you used to have to kind of submit a form to Google to let you know that this site's got Schema on. I'm assuming you don't need to do that now. No, you don't need to do that. We, we pick that up automatically. OK, no, perfect. John, I had a follow-up question on okay. the title rewriting. Um, it would be really useful if there was a way to surface that information in webmaster tools. So uh, as a webmaster, obviously, as, as we're looking at our sites and how they display, um, titles will get rewritten depending on the query, which you just said. So um, you know, having that information available or, or uh, having a separate report in webmaster tools would be uh, definitely really helpful for us. Do you see something like that? Um, making an appearance. What would you do with uh, that information then? So how how would that kind of lead back to your website, or how you would you react to that? So I think one of the uses would be around um, click through rate. So if we saw that a particular URL was being favored, um, or a particular format rather, 
Um, then for optimization for the rest of the site, we could take those hints and those clues and apply that to other URLs. OK. So essentially something maybe in the, the top search queries report where you could click on a query and you could see the, these were the titles that were shown and this was a click-through rate uh, yeah. for those specific titles. Yeah. That would be really useful. Oh, yeah, that's, that sounds interesting. Uh, we're working on the search query report at the moment, so maybe I can give that to the team on time. OK, great. That's interesting. All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, changing metadata for every 15 days will have any negative impact on the keyword rankings? Um, changing the metadata every 15 days, that shouldn't be a problem. I, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is we don't use the description or the keyword meta tags uh, for ranking at all. So if you want to change them regularly, that's fine. If you want to keep them the same, that's fine too. Uh, that wouldn't be a cause for any problem. Yeah, uh, fine. Depending on the content strategies and everything updated by the Google, we are going uh, going ahead. And is 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 they get any back impact like? Uh, um, the dropping of keyword rankings like that by changing the data. Um, if you just change the description and the keyword metadata, I don't think we'd care about that at all. You can do that however often you want. I know some sites have used that to do kind of testing for the snippet to see which snippet works best for your users, to see the click-through rate for the snippets. So if you want to do that, that's essentially up to you. Yeah, because we are changing as um, HTTPS right, uh, relatively from HTTP to HTTPS as the Google's last update. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are concentrating on that. Is there, is there will be, we would like to know that. Is there any negative impact on that? Like, because the website is uh, presently in good condition. And we want to get uh, according to the Google updates presently. Like, yeah, I wouldn't expect any visible change when you move from HTTP to HTTPS just from that change, just from SEO reasons. So that kind of ranking effect is very small and very subtle. It's not something where you will see a rise in rankings just for going to HTTPS. I think in the long run, it's definitely a good idea. And we might make that factor stronger at, at some point, maybe years in, in the future. But at the moment, you won't see any, any magical SEO advantage from doing that. And that said, anytime you make significant changes in your site and change the site's URLs, you are definitely going to see some fluctuations in the short term. So you'll likely see some drop or some changes as we recrawl and re-index everything. And in the long run, it'll settle down to about the same place. It won't settle down to something that's like a point higher or something like that. OK, thank you. So I think that's just important to keep in mind when you make these kind of changes on your website, move from HTTP to HTTPS. It's not a magic bullet that fixes your website. It's rather something for the long run that I think makes a lot of sense. And you might see some effects from the user side at some point. But at least in the short term, you're not going to see any visible SEO advantages. It's a really small ranking factor there. Yeah. OK, uh, we recently performed a 301 to a new domain. After more than three months, we still haven't gotten back our previous rankings, although the pages didn't have any particular changes. How long does it take to recover from this type of site move? Uh, in practice, this should be something that goes fairly quickly. So moving just from one domain to another and following all the steps that we have in our Help Center. Uh, we recently updated the Help Center with a lot more information. So that might be something to double check that you're doing everything right. But uh, theoretically, after a while, that should be settling down. If you're saying it's still not good after three months, that sounds like either there were some issues that were unrelated to that change that are happening. So maybe one of our algorithms is picking up problems on your website in general. And this is something that would have happened with your old site, too. 
uh, or there's something technical that's kind of stuck on your side or on our side. If you want, you're welcome to send me those URLs, and I can take a quick look on our side to see if anything is on our side that's problematic, uh, or if there's anything I can let you know about specifically with this kind of change. But in practice, if you do a site move properly and everything goes the way it should, then I would expect after a month, maybe two months, uh, it should be kind of stable again and similar to the previous uh, visibility. Uh, can you go into a bit more detail on why this Penguin refresh cycle is almost 12 months compared to the previous data refreshes of, on average, six months? Um, I don't have any specific details I can share with you guys. I know the team is working on this, so it's something where we're trying to find a way to improve that overall, and that takes a little bit longer. So uh, sometimes things don't move as quickly as you'd like, but uh, that's not because we're completely ignoring the feedback or ignoring these, these algorithms. Oop, another app indexing question. Um, do you upload a disavow to help with the Penguin update? And if you do, will you see any difference before the next refresh? Uh, so uploading a disavow file will change those links essentially into nofollow links the next time we crawl them. And uh, if you do that, then that's something that affects all of our algorithms. So uh, that could have an effect uh, before a penguin refresh if those uh, links weren't specifically tied to any penguin-related problems. It could have an effect with regards to manual actions, if there are link-based manual actions in place for your site. And it could have an effect on the penguin refresh when that happens if these links are essentially processed by them. So it's something that I wouldn't only do for penguin, but uh, rather to kind of clean up these old link issues that you might know about that you just don't want to have associated with your site anymore. On September 12th, I migrated a site from HTTP to HTTPS. I followed every step of the instructions and installed the uh, 301. Uh, from then on, I came under a significant loss of traffic and a drop in search results. Uh, why? I have to look at the site specifically to see what exactly is happening in there. But uh, let's see, September 12th isn't that far back, so this might be that you just in this, uh, this area of fluctuations where everything has to be recrawled and re-indexed again. But if you want, you're welcome to send me those URLs, and I can double check to see what exactly is happening there. Um, I'm pleased to hear that small, medium, high-quality sites will be treated more fairly by Panda. Is this a global update? Yes, this uh, Panda is a global update. It affects different languages and countries in slightly different ways, but this is something that applies across our whole search results. OK, and here's a URL. I'm not sure which URL this is for. But I'll copy it down just to make sure that I have it afterwards. I imagine this is for one of the, the site move questions. Um, let's see, site drop since October 2013, suspect the penguin algorithm change. We can't find any unnatural links or scraped content duplicates. Uh, early we're in top position for keywords. Um, I'd have to take a look at the, the site specifically to see if there's something I can find there. But uh, in general, I kind of take a step back and think about what, what you're trying to do with your website and just double check to make sure that what you're providing on your website is really of the highest quality possible and is really something that we should show number one for any of the queries that you're specifically targeting. So I, I guess I'd have to double check your site to see what it's actually about first to say anything more specific than that. Um, have you spoke to the Penguin team in the last month, and have they updated you on progress? 
Uh, we do regularly speak with the search quality teams that are working on these algorithms, and we kind of catch up to see what we can do to help them and to see where they are. So I'm guessing this is still something that would easily fall within the range of uh, before the end of the year. But as always, I can't make any promises on these kind of things because uh, things can change. And maybe this is something that will come out next week because everything is ready by then. Maybe it will take a little bit longer. But I do know the team is working on these updates. so. Hopefully, we'll have something for you guys soon. How do you remove the site? Uh, John, yes. Another question. Uh, so expounding on what you said earlier, that an algorith uh, these algorithms are never uh, you know, all uh, either all negative. Um, then uh, Penguin also has positive aspects to it where uh, you know, these sites are, are more trustworthy, and might those sites, I mean, we, we've heard about for some time, we know about that uh, there are uh, trust ranking algorithms or, you know, how sites might pass authority that are, uh, have a higher trust. So is Penguin involved in, in that uh, as well? I wouldn't specifically call it like trust algorithms or trust ranking or anything like that. But as I mentioned before, when we review these algorithms, we have to review the results as they appear in the search results in the end. So if some of these sites are demoted for the, the web spam techniques that these algorithms find, then those that pop up still play a role in our analysis. So we have to make sure that the right kind of sites are showing in the search results and uh, not just look at the sites that were demoted. So especially when we do an analysis over algorithms like this, we, we look at things like the, the first couple pages of the search results for lots and lots of queries. Uh, we send those out for review by, by neutral people who are kind of reviewing before and after this algorithm change. And they're not going to review which sites don't show up there anymore. They're going to review which sites are actually visible for those queries. So in that sense, that's something where if we show sites that are visible, that are actually higher quality, that are good sites that we could trust, uh, that we feel users can trust, that's essentially a good change. Um, some of these algorithms might be focusing on the web spam side and kind of taking those out. But every time we review the algorithms, we review what's left. We don't review just what was removed. So what's left has to be really essentially what we'd like to show users in our search results. So with that in mind, it's kind of it does bring both sides in there. But it's not that I'd say what's left has this inherent higher trust range or something like that. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, well. For example, one thing Matt mentioned uh, specifically previously was how if uh, one site is caught with uh, some link problems, they may have received like a, a 20, 30, 40 percent uh, demotion in, in a, a either the rank or, or authority, whichever you want to call it. And, and then you know, they may not be able to pass on uh, any authority as a secondary effect. So the you know 20, 30, 40 percent that these sites may get demoted relative to their linking problems. Uh, is it fair to say then um, those numbers could also go positive? Um, I don't think so. I think, don't think so. But um, I think what what you're pointing at, what Matt said, was specifically with regards to manual actions, where when we notice that a site has a lot of unnatural links on it, that maybe it's selling links, maybe it's uh, engaging in link spam or link exchange, those kind of things, and it's linking to a lot of irrelevant sites then that's something where we take manual action on those unnatural outbound links. 
and where we might say, well, we can't really tell which of these links are actually good, so we're going to ignore all of the links on this side. And that's something that we do manually, where we manually kind of take action on a site that has this problem. Uh, we'd let them know about this in Webmaster Tools as well. They'd see the unnatural outbound links message there. So that's something where we try to do that manually and try to recognize that uh, as something that we can't really trust this website anymore. Algorithmically, it's probably a little bit harder. I could imagine there, there are smart algorithms that could try to recognize the same kind of situation and also say, well, we can't really trust the links on this site because there's so many spammy links on here as well. But I don't see that going in the opposite way that we would say, oh, there are lots of good links on this site, therefore I'll trust every link here twice as much as I otherwise would. Because the, the page rank algorithms already kind of take that into account. If a site has a higher page rank, then the links will be passing a little bit of a higher page rank. So that's something where I don't think it would make sense to kind of amplify that, that aspect additionally. Right. Uh, All right, thank you. OK, um, how to remove a site link from search results. Uh, we have a feature in Webmaster Tools that lets you demote a site link. It doesn't let you remove it completely, but it's a strong signal for our algorithms that you don't want this specific site link shown. So I definitely take a look at that. One thing to keep in mind is that site links are also based on the query. So it's not something that will always be appearing in the search results. And sometimes it can happen that we think, this set of site links is pretty good for this site. And if you search for the site in a different way, we might say, well, these site links aren't really that relevant for this specific query for this specific site at this time. So just because you see a site link there when you do in maybe an artificial query or search directly for the URL of your website doesn't necessarily mean that users will also see that site link when they search naturally. But uh, you can give us that information through Webmaster Tools, and our al algorithms do take that into account. Uh, hi, John. Uh, can I ask you one question? Sure. Uh, fine. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, search queries. Um, my website getting huge of impressions, uh, like uh, 10,000 impressions for the keyword. But uh, clicks are goes to 4 and 5 only. Um, how can I improve uh, clicks rather than impressions? I uh, mean, uh, it depends upon URL structure or URL uh, brand marketing or whatever. Uh, um, that's essentially something you would need to ask your users because it's not a technical problem how to improve the click-through rate. It's essentially a matter of the user uh, believing that your site has a great, the best content for these specific queries. So. Those are things like maybe titles, maybe the snippet that's shown, maybe even the, the content or the quality of your content on your site. So it's not a technical aspect. You don't need to change the URL structure. You don't need to kind of tweak things technically on your website. It's really a matter of making sure that your content and the way you present it to users in the search results matches their needs and encourages them to say, oh, well, this matches what I was looking for. Let me check this site out. And okay. uh, that's something that's hard because there's no simple rule to say uh, how to improve the click-through rate for these queries. OK, fine, fine. Uh, one more last question, John. Uh, what is the uh, fetch and render in Webmaster's option? The what? How it be uh, fetch and render? Yes. Uh, what is the option that one? Uh, how it will be helpful uh, for the website? I didn't quite understand the last part. Sorry. Oh, fetch and render. There is an option in uh, fetch and uh, fetch and render. Yes. Uh, what is the fetch and render? How it will be helpful uh, for the website? Okay. Uh, how how is fetch and render helpful for for website in general? So. Yeah. In, in general, the, the Fetches Google feature is really helpful to double check that Googlebot can see your content. And the Fetch and Render option there is so that you can see how, how Googlebot would see your content. 
So sometimes there are things like the site getting hacked and there's different content shown. That's something fairly obvious that you can find there. But sometimes you also see that your CSS files are being blocked by robots.txt. The JavaScript that's pulling in the content is blocked by the robots.txt file. And that means that we can't render the pages in the same way that a browser could render them. And that sometimes makes it a lot harder for us to kind of understand the pages, understand the content on there. Um, in particular, with mobile, that's a really big problem. Because we, if we can't see the CSS, we can't tell that this website is actually a great website for smartphones. So we can't treat it appropriately for smartphone search, because we, we don't know. We can't see what it looks like. So that's something that I think helps a lot in the Fetch and Render tool, is that on the bottom you see the roboted resources as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, John. Sure. Uh, one thing, maybe also going back to your click-through rate question, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that not all queries are essentially the same, that you can just lump them together and say, the overall click-through rate for my website is bad. Uh, you really need to look at the queries individually. Sometimes, if someone is searching for your brand name, then maybe they don't need to click on your website because they already know your website. And they're maybe looking for something around your website or on your blog or somewhere else. Um, so you kind of have to look at the type of query as well as just just looking at the click-through rate. So uh, try to group things into things like branded queries or uh, navigational queries if someone wants to go somewhere specifically, or informational queries if they want information about a specific type of product that you might offer. And try to treat them separately when you're looking at this on your website, uh, because it helps to kind of show the real problems and not just hide them in, in a bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you, John. OK. Um, there are some URLs here. I'll, I copied those down, and I'll take a look at those separately afterwards. Otherwise, it's kind of complicated. Um, disavow question. In the first attempt, I submit uh, a link to abc.com for disavow. Then in the second attempt, I upload again without abc.com. Uh, will Google count abc.com in my backlinks? Oh, abc.com isn't really that bad. So I don't know. Seems like a good site to keep on my links if they're linking to your site. But I'll assume this is just a placeholder. Um, if you upload a second disavow file and remove links or remove domains that you had in the previous ones, then those disavow files overwrite the previous one. So essentially, the next time we crawl that link on that website, we'll see it's no longer in the disavow file. So we'll treat it as a normal link and have it pass page rank, have it affect our algorithms appropriately. Um, in both of these cases, if it's disavowed or not, we'll still show it in Webmaster Tools. So just because something is disavowed in, in your disavow file doesn't prevent it from showing up in Webmaster Tools, just like we show other links in Webmaster Tools that also have a no, in, uh, no follow on them. So that's something you'd still see it in Webmaster Tools. If you disavowed it, you'd still see it if it has a no index, uh, sorry, no follow on it. Um, and if you remove a link from a disavow file, then that no longer is in effect. So if you're updating your disavow file and you keep adding and adding more things, then you would keep the base structure the same and just keep adding. You wouldn't replace it with a new file. Um, let's see uh, about site links. I see many webmasters claims about improper site links on their sites. Uh, isn't it possible to give them opt-out chance in webmaster tools? Um, like I mentioned before, you can let us know about site links that you'd like to have demoted. We don't remove them completely in some cases, but uh, we do take that into account for our algorithms. Uh, this data is processed. I'd say maybe once a week. So you wouldn't see that change immediately. I definitely give it a week or so to kind of bubble down into the specific algorithms uh, to see what has changed there. Uh, if people in video 
uh, finished, is it OK to ask them to leave so that other people can enter? OK. I am hereby asking you to leave if other people, if you want to make room for other people. But I'll leave it up to you. Um, usually, if you want to join this, you have to be kind of quick. I post a link in the in event invite, and usually maybe a one minute or two before we start. If you've never made it to these Hangouts and you really, really want to join me, uh, let me know on Google Plus before the Hangout starts, and I'll add you a little bit before I add everyone else. So sometimes that helps. Um, I made the question about the migration from HTTP to HTTPS and consequent drop in traffic. Here are the URLs. OK. I'll just copy that down. Uh, make sure I take a look at that later. Um, uh, we've split our website in two due to corporate branding. Our rankings have dropped, but we implemented 301s and canonical tags where necessary. Have you seen anything like this before? Website split, not migration. Uh, so yes, we sometimes do see websites split uh, or kind of separate into completely separate domains. Uh, in practice, you're always going to see more fluctuations then than when you do a site move. Uh, the main problem there is that we have to take all of those signals that we have kind of collected over the years for those individual URLs, for the website in general, and find out how we should separate that. Whereas with a site move, we can say, well, the whole website is moving, so we can just take all of the signals that we have and pass them on to a new website. You'll always see fluctuations with site moves as well, but usually it's easier with site moves. So seeing fluctuations and drops in rankings, at least temporary, like this is probably normal if you're splitting the website up, just because that's such a, a bigger step, let's say, on, on the complexity scale. So uh, obviously, this isn't something that you can easily avoid. Usually, there are bigger reasons why you have to split a website up. But you should just keep in mind that this is kind of normal that you would see stronger fluctuations in a case like that. Uh, did Penguin 2.1 only look at the website's inbound link profile? Penguin 1 looked at on-site issues as well as links. Now Panda covers on-site. Uh, was Penguin 2 and 2.1 changed to only look at link signals? Uh, we call the Penguin algorithm uh, a web spam algorithm, and it tries to take into account various web spam aspects. So I don't think it would be fair to say that it only looks at links. Um, so that's something that tries to get taken into account in general. Uh, Panda, on the other side, is more of a quality algorithm where we try to focus more on the quality of the content, the quality of the website overall. So those are essentially two different aspects. Sometimes they overlap a little bit. Sometimes web spam issues are there because the quality is also low. Sometimes they're completely independent that something has web spam issues, but actually it has a really high quality website. And uh, obviously, when they don't overlap that well, that's harder for us to handle correctly. Because on the one hand, we want to discourage the web spam aspects. On the other hand, we want to show great results in the search results. John, John, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that was um, my question. There seems to be a lot of confusion about uh, page keywords um, spamming and which kind of algorithms take that into uh, consideration. I think Penguin One really did take that into consideration. But uh, when there's you know questions in the Google Webmasters forums, there never seems to be a great answer for it. So I just wanted to know if there's you know a definite answer on, on what they should be looking at and uh, which. Uh, algorithms probably mostly affected them? So we have a lot of algorithms. And most of them don't have any flashy public names. So it's hard to say that we should, like, or we'd, we'd be lumping, like, the, the keyword stuffing type algorithms into one or the other of these, these bigger algorithms. But uh, this, this kind of stuff is taken into account for, on our side. When we recognize that there is keyword stuffing happening there, that we try to figure out how to best handle it. Uh, from my point of view, a lot of these topics, when we recognize kind of this spammy activity on pages, I generally prefer our algorithms to like just react to that spammy part and say, well, 
I'm going to ignore the spammy part here because maybe the webmaster didn't really intend to spam us like this. Maybe it's something that was on their website for years and years now. Um, maybe they didn't even notice it themselves. And just focus on the good parts of the website and treat the website appropriately like that. So I think for most aspects, that's, that's a reasonable approach to take. And that's something where maybe you wouldn't even see a drop in rankings if you're keyword stuffing, but you wouldn't also see a, a rise in rankings because of this keyword stuffing. So from that point of view, it's often not a critical issue that you really, really need to resolve as quickly as possible, but something that if you have this kind of keyword stuffing on your website and you keep maintaining your website, you're going to have to keep thinking about this keyword stuffing and kind of artificially take that into account as you revamp your website, as you create a new design for it. And that's just a lot of work that can cause more problems than anything else. And since you're not having any advantage from this kind of keyword stuffing, it just makes sense to clean that up so you don't have to worry about it in the future. Do, do you think that a, a company name uh, could be classed as a key, keyword spam? And if you had your company name, say, 15 times in, in, in your page, um, theoretically, I could imagine that that might be a problem. If yeah. if the company name is something like, I don't know, cheapmortgages.com or something, in, in those kind of situations, the company name almost overlaps with the keywords that they're trying to target. And that could be seen as something where we'd say, well, this looks like you're artificially spamming these keywords. We don't really recognize it's a company name but it looks like you're trying to artificially spam these keywords, and that's something we might react to. And if yeah. you have a company name like, I don't know, xyz.com or acme.com, google.com, that's something where you're not going to be like spamming the keywords because it's your company name. You rank for it anyway. There's nobody else that's trying to compete for these terms. That's not something where we'd say this is really going to be a problem if we ignore those keywords on your page because the rest of your site is all about this company anyway. But uh, if your company name is just like keyword one, keyword two, keyword three, then obviously our algorithms are going to say, well, is this really a company name? Is this someone just trying to spam those keywords? Where do we draw the line? How much should we ignore here? And how much should we give this weight? Uh, well, we, see, we see that sometimes when sites create domains specifically for keywords where they say, my website is cheapmortgages.com, therefore I should rank for number one for cheap mortgages because you know everyone's looking for my site. They're searching specifically for my keywords, right? And that's definitely not the case. My um my company name was registered ten well, our company was registered ten years ago, so we've been trading ten years. Our website is eight years old. And I'm just really worried that Google might be thinking that our company name, Wholesale Clearance UK Limited, is because we've got that on our page four or five times. Are we overdoing our company name? Is a it's really hard Probably. to write a page and not mention our company name too much because that's what we do as well. We're wholesale. We sell wholesale stock. So, it's, uh, would Google see that our company's been registered ten years before we had a website? We wouldn't look into it in that in that detail. So it's not that our algorithms are looking for like when this company was registered and does it match the re records there. But uh, we'd look at it overall on a website. And if you're using that in a reasonable way, then I wouldn't really worry about that. Okay. And especially our keyword stuffing algorithms, we, we do try to recognize keyword stuffing, but we're not going to penalize a site for keyword stuffing in general. So you'd have to be really, really, really obnoxious to actually trigger something on our site where we'd say, we're going to demote this website completely because it's just stuffing keywords all over the place, and we have no idea what to trust it for. But uh, if this is just a name that you're repeating on your site, in the worst case, we won't be looking at that name that often. We'll say, well, this name on this site uh, or on this specific page is mentioned a lot of times. Therefore, we have to be careful about it. But if the rest of your site really focuses on that name and that's what people are searching for to find your company, then that's generally a good thing. That's not a sign that we remove your site from those search results. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, hi, John. Uh, so, John, what what would be some of those other web spam signals that uh, Penguin might look at that you suggested? And, and one question is: was was the email spam ever 
uh, thrown in that mix for uh, email spam. For example, I mean, Google may get a large quantity of bounce backs or email reports related to uh, spamming uh, link building in the past. I don't think we take email spam into account because it's just uh, such a completely separate part of Google. Uh, it's not that we like read the links in Gmail and say, oh, well, we'll pass PageRank to these. Because a lot of people share things privately, and we're not going to like dig into that. Uh, so I don't think we we take email spam in that sense into account as well. But of course, sometimes if you're really obnoxious with email spam, that stuff ends up on the web as well, going to mailing lists that are public, going to maybe forums that uh, post these mailing lists that are public. Sometimes that, that kind of leaks out into the web as well. And that's something that we might pick up on from, from those places. So it, I don't think we take into account something specifically from Gmail that's just such a different part of Google. Right. So Google may look at some of the sites uh, related to a negative sentiment on, on these links as well. Um, that's always tricky. I mean, we do try to recognize that kind of situation, but it's really, really hard to do that in, a, in, in an accurate way. So that's something where we might take that into account when there are really, really, really strong signals that are saying, uh, here's a link, and it's totally terrible, and you should not look at it at all. But if we find it as a link, we kind of recognize the context of that link. Then that's something, in real extreme cases, we might take that into account. But in general, we're not going to do that much of sentiment analysis around every link on the web to figure out, is this a positive mention or a negative mention? Uh, we're going to kind of trust the, the aspect there that if it's passing page rank, that's something that we might want to take a look at. If it doesn't pass page rank, then whatever. You can talk about it as much as you want. All right, thanks. John? Yes. Excuse me. Excuse me, John. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, are, uh, we are ranking, we are uh, working on a dot com site for an, uh, another country. John, are you listening? Yes. Yeah. Mm, we are like uh, we are working on dot com site and uh, we are targeting to another country like arab but it, we are not able to find better ranks in that is there any possibility to get well ranking in uh, countries like from your so how essentially how to optimize a site for a different country um, there are a few aspects that you'd want to look at there primarily around geo targeting so either using a top-level domain that's specifically from that country, if you, if you can do that, uh, or using a generic top-level domain and setting the geo-targeting in Webmaster Tools. That helps us quite a bit. If you have content that's valid for different countries or that's translated into different languages, uh, you can also use the hreflang markup. Uh, to let us know about those different versions. So you could say this is a version of English for uh, Saudi Arabia. This is a version of English for maybe another country there, or maybe for the UK, or maybe for the US. And let us know about that, and we can take that into account. Yeah, OK. And one more question, John. And we are having a website, and uh, with, um, we are uh, completely banned all the internal links. Only we are targeting the home page. And coming to that, we are uh, posting some blogs uh, regarding that URL. And we are not able to find the UR blogs we are posting, but uh, we are getting the category links in the uh, search engine pages. Like. OK, so essentially, like the category pages of your blog are showing up in search instead of the actual blog posts. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, sometimes we've seen sites use uh, plugins in a wrong way, in the sense that they have accidentally put no index on these pages. That's something I would definitely check. Uh, but the other aspect is sometimes just that we have to learn about this website a little bit more, and we have to learn to trust it better. And, and that happens over time, essentially. 
uh, as you grow a little bit more popular, as more users are using your site, as people are recommending your site, we can crawl a little bit deeper. We can make sure to index a little bit deeper. And that kind of happens naturally. So I would first check to make sure that technically nothing is blocking those pages from being indexed. And if uh, technically everything's OK, then I just continue working on the quality of your website and continue making it high, as higher quality as possible. Hey, John. Can I get a question? Sure. Go for it. Uh, OK. Uh, we have a website. It's seven years old, something like the YouTube, OK? Uh, we have been key, key stuffed by the SEO companies. They created more than 20,000 profiles on our website, and they link built to us. We closed everything. We 401, we deleted every, all the pages. Uh, for more than eight months, we have been trying to clean everything. And uh, when will we see changes? We had 50,000 visits from Google per day. Now we are on 200. So we, we really don't know how to recover. And we tried everything. We, it wasn't us. It was users building uh, links to our website. So is there any way to? Find out what's real the pro what's real problem in this. Um, you could send me the URL and I can take a quick look. I can't okay. promise that I have a, a quick answer for that, but I I can definitely take a look there. Um, we have some recommendations for handling this kind of profile spam when people are putting it on your site. It sounds like you figured most of that out yourself in the meantime. Uh, these are things like put using CAPTCHAs to kind of block scripts from creating these pages automatically, um, maybe no following the links there, those kind of things. But I imagine this is something you learned the hard we way. We all have that. Yeah, yeah. we disavowed more than 10,000 domains and everything, but it's just not uh, refreshing. It, yeah. it, it's, uh, go we launched a new version of the website about 20 days ago. Google is crawling about 150,000 pages per day. Okay. Uh, can we expect changes in some normal time, two to three months? Usually, if you significantly change your website, that's something where you would see changes, yes. OK. I have sent you a link on the right side. It's flibby.com. OK. Yeah. If okay. you have time, send yeah. me an email, uh, uh, info at flibby.com or nitro at flibby. I can send you my email just. Okay. If you can, just please help us. It's not us building invalid links. It's just users. Uh, same as the YouTube has the problem uh, and other uh, media companies. Mm -hmm. So we, we are not trying to be bad, but users are using uh, us in illegal way. So I won't bother anymore. Please just help us. Just give me how to fix this. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick look afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, we have an AdWords account with average CDR about 6 to 7%. We recently created a remarketing campaign that works fine, but brings down our average CDR about to 2 uh, to 3%. Is it better to have the remarketing campaign to another AdWords account? What do you suggest? I can't give you any ad advice. I'm sorry. I, I really don't know. Um, we, we split the web search, the organic side, from the ad side completely. So I really don't know what, what I could help you there. Uh, I check with the AdWords forum, perhaps. I don't know if they also do these kind of hangouts. But I, I can't help with that. Sorry. OK. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let me just go run through some of these questions here to see if there's anything I can add here. Uh, after successful disavow, will my webmaster links get decreased? No. As I mentioned before, disavowed links still remain visible. Um, how can I tell that my disavow is successful? Um, in general, if you submit it in a technically correct way, it will always be processed continuously. It's not something that is processed once, and you'll see that it's OK. It really is processed continuously as we recrawl. Uh, I had a farmer hack and recleaned and cleaned up my site. Uh, will I recover traffic as before? Uh, usually, yes. If your site was hacked and uh, you've cleaned it up completely, then that's something that we'll pick up as we recrawl and re-index your site. 
Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, and I just also double check with the Fetches Google tool to make sure that your site is really clean. Sometimes there are different forms of hacks on a site, and some of them you see directly in a browser, and others only Googlebot sees. So kind of double check that it's really clean. Uh, should I be worried about a constant flow of irrelevant links to my website? In general, if you look at your links and you notice that there are things that you really don't want to be associated with, I just put it in the disavow file and move on. Uh, that way, you don't have to worry about it. So if you see something problematic, take care of it, and uh, it'll be kind of cleaned up. Uh, if a site was built completely using Ajax, Canvas, and WebGL, and thus has only one page with little text, uh, will Googlebot decide that it's a bad page? No, we won't treat it as a bad site. But uh, what might happen is that it's harder for us to actually get to your content. So that's something where I'd use the Fetches Google with the rendering option to see what we would actually see when we crawl the page. And maybe we'll be able to pick up the content. Maybe you'll see that some of the content is blocked by robots text that you might want to allow crawling for. Um, the other aspect is if your whole website is essentially on one URL for crawling purposes, then that makes it essentially impossible for us to find the rest of your content because it depends on how you click through your site. So if you can set it up to use separate URLs, uh, you can do that using HTML5 push state, for example. Uh, then that makes it possible for us to crawl those individual URLs and to actually index them separately. So that might be something worth looking at as well. But it's definitely not the case that we would treat a site like that as being bad. Um, let's see. Um, how can we bring more visitors to our Google Plus page? Essentially, this is a page like any other on the web. You can recommend it to your users. You can encourage your visitors to recommend it to their friends. It's not something where we would say Google Plus pages are inherently different than any other kind of web page out there. Uh, when I search keywords in search results, showing different types of meta title rather than the original title, uh, we talked about this briefly. Um, I have a bunch of other questions here. So maybe I'll just open up to you guys. What, what's left? What's still on your mind? What can I help with? Yeah, I've got a que uh, question, John. OK. Um, it's, uh, it's been three weeks since I converted my entire site to HTTPS. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed an interesting pattern. Every single page that did not have rel equal canonicals in it converted to TTPS within 24 hours. But every page that did have rel equals canonical has not converted in the index at all after three weeks. It's still stuck at the, at the old one. OK. That shouldn't actually be the case. Yeah, that's, that's a bit weird. Um, yeah. So is it's that the basically one you have on, your, on your name tag. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's which means it's basically all the best part of my website is not converting, but my forum, which is still a good part, that converted overnight. Okay. Uh, one thing that you might want to do is look at the cache pages there. So what, what sometimes happens, and I know it confuses webmasters a lot, is we'll have multiple URLs associated with the same content, but we'll actually index it primarily under one of these word versions. And you usually see that if you look at the cache page. So if you do something like a site query, you see those old URLs that you think should be under the new URL. If you click the drop down and click on cache page, it'll show you the URL on top that we actually index this content under. And what might be happening there is we show it in the site query, but actually we index it as HTTPS, and then you're essentially covered. OK. But uh, I'll double check to make sure that there's nothing otherwise weird. Well, yeah, I've done there. everything. I've followed everything you know, that's out there, and I've given up. OK. Um, I, 
I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. That's something that sometimes it just takes a little bit longer to catch up. Um, mm -hmm. We notice that we can't always trust rel canonical, especially when it's used in a bad way. But in general, when we find it and we see it used properly, we do try to take it into account. In addition to the 301, it's a pretty good signal. Uh, for example, we've seen a lot of sites have a rel canonical set to their home page. So they'll have a big website with lots of different pages, but the canonical is set to their home page, which theoretically, if we follow that, we drop all of these other pages and just index the home page. So that's the kind of situation we'd ignore the rel canonical. But if you're using this in a clear way to kind of let us know or confirm a move, then that's something we should be taking it into account. And it sounds like something maybe we should uh, figure out if something broke on our side or got stuck there. Yeah, well, I definitely updated all the canonicals to the HTTPS. OK, sure. All the, yeah, cool. I'll Thank take you. Hey, John, I wanted to go back to the disavow files again. OK. So you mentioned earlier that uh, any of the the sites that you put in there effectively it changes those links to be no follow. Um, do you think that those sites would also be used on aggregate? So as Google looks at all of the various disavow files that are being published by all of the various webmasters, would they be used um, to enhance, say, Panda or some of the other search algorithms? I wouldn't rule it out completely, but it's very tricky. It's not something where we'd say we can take this one-to-one -one and use it for our web spam algorithms. Um, for example, there, there's a situation where maybe a very legitimate blog is out there that has a lot of high-quality content and good links in it, but it happened to get stuck on some list of some script that auto-posts comments. And a lot of sites might have auto-posted comments there that are essentially useless links that we should be taking out. But the rest of the content on this blog is actually really high-quality content. Uh, we see that happening a lot with government websites, for example, that they'll have really good content on the website, but they have it set up in a way that allows random people to add comments and links to those pages, so they're taken advantage of by a lot of spammers. And if these sites all disavow those government pages, then that kind of cleans up the, that connection between that government site and their site, those spammy links that they dropped there in the past. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this other government site is really low-quality spammy website that's just spamming everyone. It just happened to be open for other people to get spammed. So that's something where I could imagine, to some extent, we might take that into account to double-check some of our, our web spam algorithms. but. We really, really need to be careful when we do that, that we don't kind of take into account sites that are essentially good sites that just happen to get taken advantage of. Right. John, uh, I have to ask, why doesn't Google just ignore all the comments so they immediately stop all spamming online on the comments? I don't think it would work that way. But yes, it would be nice if we could stop that kind of comment spam. I mean, we saw it, for example, when we introduced the nofollow tag. Um, lots of websites moved to the nofollow tag, but a lot of these auto-posting spam scripts, they essentially post their comments regardless. They don't even recognize that these comments are being nofollow. So it would be nice if we could just like flip a switch and say, OK, all spammy comments will disappear, or people will stop spamming after we make this change. But realistically, I don't think that's quite that easy. All right. Um, we're a bit over time already. So I just want to thank you all for all of your questions and comments. It's been really interesting. John, one second. John, one second. OK, one last one. Happy weekend. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's. New Year, yeah. Weekend, right? <laughs> yeah. Not here in Switzerland, but yes. A great great chat with you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So have a great weekend, everyone. Uh, I hope to see you guys again. I'll set up the new Hangouts later today. And uh, feel free to add any questions that I missed there uh, so that we can go through those then. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jan. Get it.